This video is about finding surface integrals of scalar functions. We'll motivate the idea of a surface integral and by coming up with a surface integral representing the mass of a surface with a given density. Um, the density is a function of x, y, and z where that is mass per unit area. We'll look at formulas for the surface integral um, when z is a function of x and y and when y is a function of x and z, and when x is a function of y and z, you'll see they're all very similar. You're really only learning one of them and then understanding how that formula changes when our surface is represented in, in one of these other ways. Um, and then after we find um, those surface integrals in terms of functions like these, we'll talk about how we would set up and solve a surface integral um, for a parametrically defined surface. <coughs> So let's say we've got a surface S. It looks maybe something like this. And then we look at the projection of S onto the XY plane. We call that R. Now I know that the projection of this cartoon surface that I drew onto the XY plane isn't a circular region like this. But you get the idea. We're talking about the portion of S that's above the region R. And um, if we have a function, f of x, y, z that's defined on the surface s, we can define what's called a surface integral of f over s. And we're calling this the surface integral of a scalar function because f of x, y, z is just a scalar function. It's not a vector. So that will be the double integral over the surface S of f of x, y, z. And then we're multiplying by ds, where ds is a tiny surface area piece. So basically, we're taking our surface. And rather than integrating over a region in the x, y plane, we're taking our surface and we're subdividing it into a bunch of little pieces. And then we're saying, when we're on this surface, on one of these little pieces, our integrand f of x, y, z is approximately constant. So let's evaluate f of x, y, z at a point, um, x sub i, y sub i, z sub i, and then multiply it by the surface area of that little piece, and then add all of those together um, to get this surface integral. Um, so this is our definition of a surface integral of a scalar function. Um, but of course, this is not um, something that you can evaluate. You've got way too many variables. We've got f of x and y um, and z. And we've got this little ds over here. s represents an area of that piece. And then we're integrating over the surface s. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to um, reduce the number of variables. And one way we can do that is that we can write this double integral over s as an equivalent double integral over this region r in the xy plane. And so here's the first of our um, surface integrals. Let's say that z depends on x and y. And since we're using f as our integrand, let's let the equation for z be g um, as a function of x and y rather than f. Or if you want, you can just write z of x, y. That works too. So the idea is we want to tie all of these variables together. And by um, using the fact that z is equal to g of x, y when we're on that surface. So rather than evaluating a double integral over a surface, We'll evaluate this integral instead. We'll look at the projection of the surface onto the xy plane. We'll call that r. And then our integrand will be evaluated at x, y, and g of x, y. Or if you want, you could call that z of x, y. It's whatever z is in terms of x and y. And then we'll multiply by that surface area piece. Earlier this semester, we studied surface area. 
we derived this formula. Take the partial of z with respect to x and the partial of z with respect to y and substitute that in. And that's going to give you the surface area of that little piece. So we're taking our function, we're multiplying it by surface area, and we're evaluating the double integral over r. Now we're using g here, but if you prefer, you can use z. I find a lot of students like using z instead of g because there are so many letters to keep track of. Sometimes you forget, what does g represent again? Well, it's just the um, function. It's z as a function of x and y. So sometimes we'll write it this way instead. And r is the projection onto the xy plane. Now, if we wanted to, if z was not a function of x and y, but y instead was a function of x and z, we could do the same thing um, with a surface integral, except instead of projecting onto the xy plane, the region R in this case, if y is a function of x and z, And we're taking y with a g of x and z. Oops. This is a projection onto the x z plane. I almost always do this one unless it's impossible to solve the problem another way. There are some problems that, due to the geometry of the situation, um, the projection onto the x y plane. Um, just doesn't work. Um, we'll see some examples like that. Um, in that case, I might do the projection onto the um, xz plane or the yz plane. And then you can, as you can imagine, the surface area formula changes. If y is a function of x and z, and if you want, you can write it that way, y is a function of x and z. We'll have the partial of y with respect to x here and the partial of y with respect to z there. And of course, lastly, the third option oops, is that x could depend on y and z. And then you would take the partial of x with respect to y and the partial of x with respect to z there. And the region r would be the projection onto the yz plane. So the idea is we're just eliminating one of those variables by writing that variable in terms of the other two. And that's going to be given by the equation of that surface. And since everything here is in terms of y and z, this is the projection onto the yz plane. I actually like the projection onto the yz plane because it's very easy to see the yz plane the way we tend to draw this. Okay, so in practice, all you do is you substitute, substitute those partials, substitute z as a function of x and y, describe the region r, and evaluate the double integral. If you're wondering why on earth would I ever do this, we've got our one contrived application, and it's not that contrived. Um, here's the idea. If this is the density of that surface in mass per unit area, and I've got some surface like this, mass on one little piece is approximately that density, which is mass per unit area times area. When I add all of those together for every single piece on the surface, that gives me mass.
Um, so that is an application of this. <coughs> there are lots of other applications, as we'll see when we talk about flux um, in the next video. Okay, so let's evaluate um, one of these, and then we'll look at the surface area for a parametrically defined surface. Okay, so let's say that we've got a density function. So let's say somebody says, suppose the surface given by the first octant portion of the plane x plus y plus z equals 3 has a certain density. And it has a density um, x squared plus 4yz. So the density varies, and at every x, y, z position, this is the density there. So somebody asks you to uh, find the mass. of the surface. Well, the mass of the surface is the double integral over the surface of the density function. So I'll substitute in my density. It was given to me, x squared plus 4yz. And now, in order to evaluate this, I need to graph the surface and then look at the projection onto the xy plane. That projection is what we've been calling r. So I've got x plus y plus z equals 3. And we're just looking at the first octant portion of that surface. So when x and y are both 0, z is 3. When y and z are both 0, we see that x is 3. And when um, x and z are 0, y is 3. So that's our surface S. And the projection onto the XY plane is that region right there. That's R. We see it includes that, that corner, that origin, and it crosses at 3 and 3. OK. Now, in order to write this integral as a double integral over r, I need z as a function of x and y, and I need ds for this surface. Um, I also need to describe the region r in the xy plane. So the idea is we're going to write the integrand in terms of x and y. Generally, you just want to write it in, two, in terms of two variables only. I have a tendency to write it in terms of x and y and project onto the xy plane, but we could have just as easily write, written it in terms of y and z and project it onto the yz plane. That would be fine. Um, and the way we do that is we solve the equation for the surface for z. And then we substitute. So 
we have on our surface x plus y plus z is equal to 3. So I'm getting z by itself of 3 minus x minus y, that's my z. And then I want my new integrand. In terms of x, y, and z, that's our density, or excuse me, in terms of x and y only, it's our density function. It's x squared plus 4y y times z, but z is replaced by 3 minus x minus y. So we substitute that in. And we can simplify. This is x squared plus 12y. <coughs> Distribute that 4y minus 4xy minus 4y squared. Okay. So now I've got my integrand in terms of x and y. Now I need my surface area piece. So let's compute ds. That requires computing the partial of z with respect to x and the partial of z with respect to y and then substituting into the formula for ds. Remember we had that formula for the surface area we studied in a previous section. Take the partial of z with respect to x, the partial of z with respect to y, you square them. Add one, take the square root, that's your surface area piece. So we just need those two partials. Well, this is pretty simple. Partial of z with respect to x, the derivative of that with respect to x, that's negative one. The derivative of this with respect to y, treating x as a constant, is negative one. So our surface area, is given by this. We substitute in negative one and negative one, and we get the square root of three times dA. Okay, so we've got our integrand in terms of x and y, we've got our surface area in terms of x and y. Happens to not involve x and y at all because those happen to be constants because we're dealing with a plane, but in general it could depend on x and y. And now you need to describe that region R, rather than of integrating over the surface, we're going to integrate over the projection onto the xy plane. Well, there are lots of different ways you can represent this. I prefer to let y go from a function to a function and x go from a constant to a constant. Let's do the easy part first. x goes from 0 to 3. y starts at 0, and it goes to that line. The line has a slope of, when well, we go down three and over three, so a slope of negative one and it passes through at three. So we get three minus x there. So those are our bounds. So we're looking at the graph of R, letting x go from a constant to a constant, letting y go from a function to a function. And then once you've done all of that, you substitute into the surface integral. And in this case, it was the integral for mass. Okay, so I've got mass equals the double integral over s of my integrand, which depends on x, y, and z right now, times ds. And that's going to become the double integral over r of my new integrand, which ended up being this very long expression, x squared plus 12y minus 4xy minus 4y squared. And so that's my integrand in terms of x and y.
and then we substitute our ds, which happened to be square root of 3 times dA. And then we substitute in our bounds. We said that x goes from 0 to 3, and y goes from 0 to 3 minus x. Just looking at that, y goes from this line to that line, while x goes from 0 to 3. And we'll integrate with respect to y first and then x. And that represents the mass of the surface. Now, I think this is a pretty simple integral to evaluate. We just use the power rule a lot, um, then the fundamental theorem. And then there's going to be more power rules everywhere for these x's. Um, so I'm not going to evaluate this, but I, I want you to know how to set up the integral. Um, the mass of a surface is the density times the surface area. You need inter the integrand in terms of two variables, surface area in terms of two variables, and then whatever those two variables are, you need to the, the projection onto the corresponding plane, um, and you need bounds for that. I generally project onto the xy plane, so I get an integrand in terms of x and y, a surface area in terms of x and y using this formula that we studied previously, and then I describe r, which I found by graphing my surface and then looking at the projection, <coughs> um, where x goes from a function to a function, and y, or y goes from a function to a function, and x goes from a constant to a constant, and I substitute. Um, and then we would evaluate that. Okay, so that's how we find mass. Let's do one more example like that. Let's say somebody asks you to evaluate this integral. They don't tell you it represents anything, but they just say, evaluate this surface integral where um, z is equal to x squared plus y squared, and the region that we're interested in is the region in the xy plane where x squared plus y squared ranges from um, 4 to 16. Well, the first thing I would do is I would graph this surface. If there were no bounds on x and y, it would just be an elliptic paraboloid facing up. Surface we're very familiar with, x and y are both squared and positive, z is raised to the first. And then Let's think about this, that projection onto the xy plane. Well, x squared plus y squared equals 4 is one bound. That's a circle of radius 2 centered at the origin. And then we go over here to x equals plus and minus 4. Oops, <laughs> trying, not, not doing so well. But that's what we're given. You thinking what I'm thinking? Are you thinking polar coordinates? If you are, then you're thinking what I'm thinking. Okay, so that's my region in the xy plane. So it looks like this, roughly. This is very roughly. <laughs> In three dimensions. We've got a circle of radius two, sort of cut out over here, and a circle of radius four over here. And that's the region R, which means we're just going to get part of this surface. Our surface F, S, excuse me, is the part of this elliptic paraboloid that lies above this. Um, well, it goes, well, when x squared plus y squared equals 4, that's z equals 2. When x squared plus y squared equals 16, 
oh, actually, x squared plus y squared equals 4 is z equals 4. Um, x squared plus y squared equals 16 is z equals 16. So this is very much not just scales. So that's 16, and that's 4. But we get the part of the elliptic paraboloid where z ranges from 16 to 4. And this is r. Okay, so what do we do first? We always sketch if we can. So we sketch the surface S and its projection onto the XY plane. We see that polar coordinates are probably going to be best, um, but what I would recommend is first you transform this into rectangular coordinates, and then once it's in rectangular coordinates, then you go to polar coordinates. So let's write this double integral over S as a double integral over R first, and then we'll go to polar. So we're going to begin the process of writing this as a double integral over R. <coughs> so we're writing the surface integral as an equivalent double integral over R. And the way we do that, the first thing we do is we need an integrand in terms of x and y. That our original integrand was xy over z, but z is x squared plus y squared. Okay? And now we need ds while we're on that surface. So we'll compute ds, and we want ds in terms of x and y. So we'll state the formula for ds. It's a little surface area piece. And in here goes the partial of z with respect to x, and there's the partial of z with respect to y. And we are on this surface, z equals x squared plus y squared. So I look at this, and I need to compute those two partials. And then we substitute. So the partial of z with respect to x is just 2x. Partial of z with respect to y is 2y. And that means ds is the square root of 1 plus the partial of z with respect to x squared plus the partial of z with respect to y squared. And that da is a dx dy or dy dx, whichever we prefer. Each of those has two factors. Square each factor separately. Maybe factor out the 4. Now you see that x squared plus y squared, which is going to be nice when we change the polar coordinates, right? OK. So our ds in terms of x and y is this. So now let's substitute to write the integral in terms of r. So we want to substitute our integrand and ds in terms of the new variables x and y. These integrals aren't that bad. And you have this extra calculation, but it's just a lot of substitution, really. So we'll do the double integral over r of the new integrand. So that's xy over x squared plus y squared. Instead of integrating over the surface, we integrate over its projection onto the xy plane. And then we multiply by dA. Or not dA, ds, which is this times dA. And if I want to evaluate this, I'll look at r. It's most easily described in polar coordinates. 
I would write everything in polar coordinates. So let's find the bounds for R and polar coordinates. Well, obviously theta goes from zero to two pi. Theta is an angle that sweeps around the xy plane. And remember R, when I think, whenever I'm trying to find bounds for R, I'm thinking of concentric circles, circles centered at the origin. R equals two is that circle of radius two. R equals four is that circle of radius four. Isn't that nice? Nice constant bounds. It's so much better than the square root of 16 minus x squared and the square root of 16 or 4 minus x squared. That would be really tough to describe in rectangular coordinates. We would do it, but it wouldn't be pretty. <coughs> so we've got bounds for r. Now we want the integrand of this whole thing in terms of r and theta like this new integrand. I put a star by it for the, the new integrand. And then don't forget that in polar coordinates, if dA is not dr d theta, it's r d r d theta. So our integrand, that's xy over x squared plus y squared times the square root of one plus four times x squared plus y squared. That's this. This is r squared. This is r squared. x is r cosine of theta. y is r sine of theta. We're dividing that by r squared and we're multiplying by the square root of four plus r squared. And notice the r squared in the numerator reduces with the r squared in the denominator. So we end up with sine of theta, cosine of theta times the square root of one plus four r squared. Now you don't have to do this. When you integrate with respect to theta later, you could use a u substitution, but I think I wanna use a trig identity. Two times this is sine of two theta. This is actually one half of sine of two theta. Just to make the integration a little bit easier. Sine of two times an angle is two times sine of the angle times cosine of the angle. That's why I did that. And why did I do it specifically is because integrating that is just a tiny bit easier than integrating that. You could integrate that with a u sub two, that would be fine. Okay, and now our new dA is r d r d theta. Okay, so this integral needs a new integrand, which is right here, a new dA, and the bounds for r, which we found up there. So we'll, we'll substitute all of those. This is a pretty ugly looking thing. <laughs> I admit it. And I love math. I think it's beautiful. And this integrand does not look appealing. But we said, hey, instead of evaluating that, why don't we evaluate this? Since R is that sort of washer looking um, region in the xy plane. We've got these bounds. Um, the new integrand is this, at least before we multiply by that r from dA. And then dA is r times dr d theta. And that is equal to this integral. Okay. Now I'll do this uh, relatively quickly because I want to show you a surface integral over a parametric surface before we finish up this video. 
So I'm integrating with respect to r. So I'll factor out the 1 half, and I'll factor out that sine of 2 theta. And I've still got the integral from 2 to 4 of r times the square root of 1 plus 4 r squared dr. Just focused right here. Well, that requires a u sub. So let u be the inside function to use the derivative of that times dr. I don't have an eight, so I'll divide by eight. I need new bounds. When r equals four, I've got uh, 16 times four is 64, plus one is 65. When r equals two, I've got four times four is 16, plus one is 17. So this is a u to the one half power, because that's what a square root is, right? And r dr is one eighth du. And the new bounds for u are 65 and 17. That's all that in the parentheses there in red. Don't forget that d theta from before. So that's that. And we can factor out that one eighth if we want to. And actually, there's no theta here, so we can even factor out the d theta. We'll evaluate this integral separately. And now I've already factored out the one eighth, so I'm just focused on this. So we add one to the exponent, divide by the new exponent. Oops. Yeah, dividing by 3 halves is multiplying by 2 thirds. Evaluate at 65 and 17. Run that 2 thirds times that over here. So we get, well, 2 goes into 16 8 times, so 1 over 24. And then this is. 65 to the 3 halves, 65 root 65 minus 17 to the 3 halves. You could pull that constant out. Oops, 65, sorry. And then we're taking the antiderivative of sine of 2 theta. Antiderivative of sine is negative cosine. And since we have a constant inside, we divide by the constant. And we evaluate from theta equals 0 to theta equals 2 pi. Negative 1 half of this, well, that 1 half can multiply that 24, so I have 1 over 48. And that negative times this will just change that a minus b to b minus a. And then we evaluate cosine at 2 pi or cosine of 2 pi times 2. So cosine of 4 pi minus cosine of 0. What? It's cosine of 4 pi is 1. Cosine of 0 is 1. All that work just to get 0. All right. <laughs> sort of anticlimactic. That's OK. What happens? Sometimes complicated integrals turn out to be zero. <laughs> All right, so we've got one last example. I told you we would look at the equation for a surface integral for a parametric surface. Well, in the last video, we talked about finding ds for a parametric surface. If r is given by x of u and v times i hat plus y of u and v times j hat plus z of u and v times k hat. So that's our surface for u, v in some region d in the u, v plane. Um, we said earlier that the surface area of that surface is given by 
the magnitude of this cross product times du dv. <clears throat> now that still ha that hasn't changed, except now instead of just adding all of those up to get surface area, we're saying let's take that little surface area piece and multiply it by a function to get a surface integral. Well, we need one. We need a couple of variables to tie everything together. If we're on a parametric surface, the two variables that tie everything together are u and v. So instead of doing a double integral over s, you're going to look at the double integral over d. That's that region in the uv plane. Then you evaluate your function, your integrand, in terms of u and v. So you've got x as a function of u and v, y as a function of u and v, and z as a function of u and v. And that surface area piece is just this guy here. And of course, you could change the order on that DUDV, but it's sort of exactly what you would expect. It's just the integrand in terms of U and V through substitution and the DS in terms of U and V. And then you evaluate this rather than evaluating that. So that's our formula for surface integral of a parametric surface. <coughs> Let's do one example of that. And then we'll wrap this one up. So let's say our integrand is pretty simple. It's just x plus y plus z, oops, plus z. And our parametric surface is r of u and v with components 2 cosine of u, 2 sine of u, and v, where v ranges from 0 to 1, and u ranges from 0 to pi over 2. OK. Now, in order to visualize what I'm doing, I need to graph my parametric surface. That's my x, that's my y, and that's my z. First of all, I notice right away that the x and y have a cosine of u and a sine of u. So if I square those and add those together, I should be able to use that trick identity, sine squared plus cosine squared is 1, to simplify. So my x is 2 cosine of u. My y is 2 sine of u. And watch this. Square both factors separately. When you factor out that four, we get cosine squared u plus sine squared u, and that's of course one. So what did that simplify to? Ignore all this calculation, it's just x squared plus y squared equals four. So in the xy plane, it's just a circle of radius two centered at the origin. Now if you're saying to yourself, well, what is the surface though? That's just a curve. You're absolutely right. How, how do we include z in this formula? Actually, we can't. We don't. Um, if we're thinking of this as a surface, and we absolutely should be thinking of this as a surface, this is what we see in the xy plane when z equals zero. And z does equal zero at one point because z and v are the same thing. Uh, z. Uh, v goes from 0 to 1, so that means z goes from 0 to 1. So what we actually get is not this circle in the xy plane, but a cylinder that opens around the z-axis. So I was asked to integrate f of x, y, and z equals x plus y plus z. And our surface is the, surf, um, the cylinder of radius 2, the projection onto the xy plane is pretty simple, it's just that circle, but z goes up to 1 because we were given this.
we were told that V goes from zero to one and V and Z are the same thing because that's my X and that's my Y and that's my Z on my parametric surface. So this, since Z and V are the same thing, that means Z goes from zero to one and then because of trig identities, we saw that the equation of our surface is x squared plus y squared equals four, which we just did on the last page. So the projection onto the xy plane is that circle of radius two centered at the origin. That's r. And this is not to scale, but I'm just doing it for emphasis. There's our cylinder. Z goes from zero to one, and <coughs> we're integrating over R. Well, if I want this to be my integrand, but the surface integral over S, of F of X, Y, Z, DS, Well, I need to write that this way. I need to write that as the double integral over the region R of f of x and y, and z is a function of x and y on my surface, um, and then times ds, which looks like that. This is what I would normally do, right? you see the problem? I don't be careful. Don't solve this for z. The equation of the surface doesn't have a z in it, so I can't get a z as a function of x and y. And actually, um, when I'm on this curve, z is free to be anything, so it's definitely not a function. z is not a function of x and y, because like, every x, y pair down here corresponds to infinitely many z values. Um, so this is a case when it may, might make more sense to project onto the yz plane. So rather than doing this, let's project onto the yz plane. Or actually, well, yeah. So we'll, if we project onto the yz plane, that means we need x as a function of y and z. And then over here, we'll have the partials of x. Oh, actually, what am I doing? This is all right, and this would be fine for this surface, but we don't have to do this because it's a parametric surface. Even easier way. Okay, let's not do that at all. Sorry, guys. I'm very grateful that it's not written this way. Since it's a parametric surface, we don't have to do that. We just write F in terms of U and V. So we replace X with X of U and V, Y with Y of U and V, and Z with Z of U and V. And then DS is the magnitude of this cross product. Sorry about that. I know you guys are very busy. I don't want to waste your time. But I don't want to make a whole nother video either and make you wait on a video. So um, we'll, we'll do this. Um, we need our integrand in terms of x, y, and z. It was just x plus y plus z. So it's going to be this plus this plus z. Here's my x plus my y plus my z. And now I need this integrant or this um, surface area piece in terms of u and v. So I need to calculate that. The partial of r with respect to u comes from taking the partial uh, partials of each of those components with respect to u. So we get negative two sine of u, two cosine of u, and zero. 
Now we take the partials with respect to V. That's pretty nice. There's no V's there. No V's there. And that one's looking pretty simple. So we get zero, zero, one. All right, now let's take the cross product of this with this. Cross out the row and column containing i hat, and we get two cosine of u. Cross out the row and column containing j hat. Don't forget the minus. We have minus a negative two sine of u, so it's going to be plus two sine of u. Cross out the row and column containing k hat, zero minus zero. I don't know about you, but I can tell that that is a vector with length two. Let's prove it. Take the components, square them, add them, and take the square root. Of course, that zero squared doesn't do much. So we end up with a four times the quantity cosine squared plus sine squared. That's nice, that's one. Square root of four is two. So our ds, turns out to be 2 times du dv. That's very nice. Okay, and then the bounds were given to us. They told us that v went from 0 to 1, and, oh, I didn't, I forgot. The bounds for u were right here. u goes from 0 to pi over 2. Wait a minute. If u goes from 0 to pi over 2, that's not our region r. It's OK. We're almost done. So we've got the integral from 0 to 1 of the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of this integrand. times 2 times du dv. And that's so simple that I'm going to let you evaluate that. And remember, that represents the double integral over the surface of this. We would have had to do it this way if we were given x squared plus y squared equals 4. We'd have to look at the projection onto the yz plane or the xz plane because there's no, um, there's no z in that equation. But since we were given the surface parametrically, we could do this instead, which is very nice. This was pretty easy. That's just x plus y plus z. And in terms of u and v, that we computed. So find the two partials, take the cross product, find its length. That goes here. Now, you just got to evaluate this integral over the stated bounds. But I want to correct this picture. This picture is wrong. Picture's close to right, but it's wrong. X squared plus Y squared plus equals 4 is that equation, but if U goes from 0 to pi over 2 rather than 0 to 2 pi, at 0, X is going to be 2, and Y is going to be 0. And at pi over 2, X is 0, and Y is 2. So our region um, in the xy plane, r, would be this. So it wouldn't be too bad. Well, it is bad because that doesn't involve a z. <coughs> um, and so, so we'd be in trouble there. Uh, but that's actually the region that we're integrating over. We're integrating this um, function. Well, that's what the, the region looks like in the xy plane. But we actually end up with integrating this function over this part of the surface. It's just the part that goes from here to here. So like that's the surface that we're integrating over. Okay. All right. So it doesn't actually affect the integration. But we 
write in the stated bounds for u and v. We have our integrand in terms of u and v. That was our x, that was our y, and that was our z. And then that is this piece, which required taking two partials, taking a cross product, and finding its magnitude. Okay, so let's briefly review. That's a surface integral. If this represents density, this gives us mass. We've got mass per unit area times area. I can write this three different ways. I can project onto the xy plane by writing the integrand in terms of x and y. I just need to find z as a function of x and y here and take its partials with respect to x and y to get surface area. If z isn't a function of x and y, but maybe y is a function of x and z, you do the same thing, but you project onto the xz plane and you replace y with that function of x and z. Then you take the partials of y with respect to x and z over there for your surface area piece. Or if x is a function of y and z, you could do this. That's how we handle that. Now, if our surface is a parametric surface, this surface integral is written this way. You write the integrand in terms of u and v by making a substitution. You just take the x component, y component, and z component of r, and you substitute them in. And then you find the surface area of one little piece over here by computing a couple of partial derivatives, taking a cross product, finding a magnitude, and then just substituting it in. And so we get something like this. The bounds are usually stated for that parametric surface, and you just evaluate the integral.